I think we best start. So um, in this session, we have uh, two papers. The first is from um, Rob calvert jump who is a researcher at the um, University of Greenwich. Um, and what he's going to be talking about is, is neighbourhood renewal funds and whether they improve local labour market outcomes. Um, and the abstract is there if you want more detail, but I think what we can um, do is move on to Rob. So I've given the speakers a bit more time if they want it for their talks, but hopefully they won't use lots, so we've got a bit of time for discussion as we only have two papers in this session. So over to you, Rob. Brilliant, thanks, Nigel. Let me mute my video. And... Okay, there we go. Back again. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks, Nigel. Thanks for the introduction um, and thanks for inviting me. So, um, so this is a paper co-authored with a colleague uh, from the US on new Labour's flagship attempt to uh, improve outcomes in uh, deprived local authorities in the early noughties. Oh, there we go. A boilerplate, uh, the, so the views that I'm, uh, I'm going to express are... are, are. Um, right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bit of background on the National Strategy for Neighbourhood Renewal and the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund, what they were, how they related to one another, um, talk about the questions that we are looking to answer and why, um, and then we'll look at some results. I will try and keep everything ready. Uh, so what was the National Strategy for Neighbourhood Renewal? Well, basically, it was the last serious attempt by any government, um, uh, at least prior to, to, to levelling up, um, to level up. Uh, it was launched by New Labour in 2001, um, and it was a relatively broad-based uh, sub-regional development uh, strategy, which targeted 88 of authority districts in England, there were similar um, similar programmes in Scotland and Wales, which we're not looking at. So we're focusing on, 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 on the NSNR as it applied to England. Um, the 88 local authority districts were determined by the index of multiple deprivation, which was briefly mentioned in the last session. The index of multiple deprivation was actually developed um, at the same time, pretty much, by John Prescott's office. Um, the goal of the strategy was to improve relative outcomes uh, with respect to health, education, crime and employment, worklessness at least, um, in these local authorities, although in principle the National Strategy for Neighbourhood Renewal applied to the whole of the country. Uh, part of its rationale was that mainstream services weren't particularly joined up and they were very badly joined up in deprived parts of the country. And if you could somehow join them up and make mainstream services and uh, nationwide services work better together, then you could probably um, improve outcomes in health, education, crime and employment in deprived parts of the country. But certainly they focused on 88 very deprived local authority districts and the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund was the funding arm of the, of the National Strategy for Neighbourhood Renewal and dispersed about three billion pounds to those 88 local authorities between 2001 and 2008. 2008 was when the programme was wound up and replaced by a similar but slightly smaller programme under Gordon Brown. Um, so we're talking about something that lasted a long time. It targeted uh, quite a number of deprived areas and the amounts of money that were involved are similar to the kinds of um, sums that, that the current government's talking about when it's in, in, in the terms of the Towns Fund or the Leveling Up Fund, things like that. I think the Towns Fund's about 3.9 billion. The local authority districts that received NRF funding in black. And there were similar programmes in Wales and Scotland, which we're not looking at. What you can see here is that um, most of the authority, local authority districts, I by, the, by New Labour, by their social exclusion, but either in metropolitan areas, 
um, or close to them. The exception um, is some industrial town districts, uh, but even then, you're, you're, these were usually quite close to cities, which is important when we come to think about policy implications. The, uh, the really big uh, exception to that was Cornwall, which is obviously historically quite a deprived. Uh, so motivation, why are we, sorry, I'm having trouble with the with Zoom. Um, motivation, so why are we interested in this? Well, from, for, from the perspective of this um, conference, uh, I guess that most people would be interested in this because we use ONS uh, statistics that aren't used that often in academia. So, uh, so in particular, we use the annual business inquiry data set, and we use the old local labor force uh, survey data set as well. Um, my colleagues are obviously American, so there's, I mean, place-based policies are a massive thing in America, in the US, um, and of course, now that uh, the, the Conservative government has 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 turned towards levelling up as as a vote winner, that was that's the narrative. Um, in principle, we should be we should be looking back at the things that New Labour did and learning from them. Did they work? How well did they work? Um, why did they work? So on and so forth. So, number of reasons that we might be interested and. Um, this is, I'm almost certain, the first uh, evaluation of the labour market effects of the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund since the official uh, Department for Communities and Local Government study in 2010. Um, and there was, a, there was an interim report in 2008 as well. So it hasn't been looked at for a while, um, at least in, in the effects of, of labour market outcomes. The basic question, the specific question that we're asking, um, is how do improvements in local labour supply through all the various investments that the National Strategy for Neighbourhood Renewal um, and the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund um, uh, promoted, how do they affect labour market outcomes in terms of worklessness and in terms of employment? We largely follow the approach of um, a paper by um, Alonso and, and, and co-authors who best of my knowledge, the only existing academic um, evaluation of the NRF since the official government evaluations, um, but they focus on crime. They use a simple difference in differences approach, um, and we basically follow them, but we extend their method using a spatial diff and diff to look at spillover effects, because we think spillover effects are likely to have um, existed and um, a set identified diff and diff that's that's robust to various biases that you can that you can that, that, that those models can suffer from. But I'll I'll talk about all of that um, as we go along. So just to recap before we look at results, we are looking at the labor market impact of the neighborhood renewal fund, which took place between 2021 and 2008. England, sorry, I'm still having trouble with this, these Zoom things. Um, there we go. We're looking at the, the, the labour market impact, we're looking at the effect on jobs, we're looking at the effect on employment, we're looking at the effect on self-employment, we're looking at the effect on worklessness measured by claimants, um, and we are using a difference in differences strategy. So what you're looking at here, if you are not familiar with them, is basically... Um, the, the graphical output of, a, of an event study difference in differences um, model. What we have on the, le on, the, on the vertical axis is the percentage um, effect of the NRF on the dependent variable, which in this case is job counts in local authorities, right? So 0.2 um, uh, would be 2%, minus 0.04 would be 4, minus 4%, so on and so forth. And on the horizontal axis, you've got years in relation to NRF implementation. Zero, year zero, and you can see my mouse, that's here. Year zero is fiscal year 2002. So that was fiscal year 2002 was when, um, was when NRF funds started being dispersed. Uh, fiscal year 2001 is normalized to zero. 
And each of these point estimates, which are the filled circles with their confidence intervals, they are basically um, point estimates of effect sizes of the NRF relative to 2001. So if we take this point estimate at period six at face value, what that's saying is that job counts in local authority in, in neighborhood renewal fund treated local authorities were about 2% lower um, six years after the implementation of the policy relative to uh, all the other local authority districts in England that weren't treated by the NRF, that didn't, um, that didn't receive NRF funds. Um, of course, that's not a statistically significant result. So what this is telling us is that over the lifetime of the policy, the, uh, the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund doesn't seem to have had any effect on, 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 on local job creation. On the other hand, if we look at employees, this is employee counts, this is from, um, from, the, from, the lab, from the local area labour force survey and then the annual population um, survey after that. Um, there does seem to have been a significant treatment effect on, on, on employees, right? By the end of it, uh, in, in, the number of employees, of people employed by firms in NRF treatment areas was about 5% higher than it was in the non-NRF uh, non parts of the country. On average, the effect was about 2.5%. If we look at self-employment, it's even higher. It peaks at about 20% four years after implementation, and the average effect is about 9 percent now putting that into actual numbers in 2001 in the nrf treatment areas there were about 78,000 employees on average and there was about 10,000 self-employed workers so you're looking at somewhere around 90,000 people employed in these areas with um, a median population of about 140,000 um, so the results on employment and self-employment suggest that the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund was responsible for the creation of around 3,000 um, jobs for its resident households um, in, 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 in the median treatment district. And 3,000 on, on top of a, a pre-treatment total of about 90,000 isn't too bad. Now, how does that square with the... Current null effect on jobs, or well, jobs are measured on a workplace basis. Employment is um, measured on a residence basis. So we don't think that the NRF was causing any jobs to be created inside NRF treatment areas. So inside these um, areas highlighted back, we do think that it was helping people get employed that lived in these areas. What's the implication? Well, the implication is that they're probably finding jobs outside of the treatment area. That makes a lot of sense if, 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 if we remember that the NRF treatment areas were in cities or close to cities or at least towns, which were presumably a lot of um, cities in the early noughties. Moving on to claimants, the uh, impact on claimants looks relatively large, um, but of course there are, mu there, 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 there are much fewer claimants um, in these areas than there are total employments. Now, this uh, result with an average effect of about minus 5.6% on, on job seekers' allowance claimants that implies that less than 400 claimants um, were being taken off the books. It doesn't square massively well with, with the estimates for employment. Now, what's the reason for that? The reason for that is here, basically. Now, the identification assumption in the difference in differences model is that basically there should be no effect, there should be no difference um, in the evolution of the treatment variable prior to the treatment date, which is fiscal year 2002, and then you should get a change afterwards. Now, what we see here is that the number of job seekers, job seekers allowance claimants in treatment areas was increasing relative to non-treatment areas prior to the policy and then started decreasing quite, quite rapidly. Now, in principle, we should take account of this trend, right? Because um, if the number of out-of-work benefits claimants was increasing in deprived parts of the countries relative to non-deprived parts of the countries prior to 2002, in the absence of the NRF, one might assume that it would keep increasing, right? 
So these estimates here might downplay the, um, the treatment effect of the NRF on worklessness. And indeed, if we implement a, um, a technique that controls for this, then we get a much larger effect on claim. Um, and it would appear, if we control for, uh, for, for differential pre-trends in the run-up to the policy, that the impact of the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund on, on, on job seekers' allowance claimants was actually much larger. Um, these numbers imply the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund uh, caused at least a thousand claimants to come off the books. Um, for each of the NRF treatment areas, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000. And that's much more consistent with the, with, with the evidence for about 3,000 um, 3, uh, employment opportunities being created. Okay, so that's our results. That's um, nearly done, really. I'll just um, summarise what we've got and then talk a bit about policy conclusions. So basically what we're saying um, is that the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund appears to have had no obvious effect on job creation within treatment areas. The total employment in the median NRF district increased by about 3,000 people as a result of the policy, um, suggesting that jobs were being found outside of treatment areas. Um, if we control for differential pre-trends, we think that out-of-work benefit claim has decreased uh, by at least 1,000 persons as a result of the policy. Um, now, one of the major contributions that we're, that, that we're making is that that number is substantially higher than, than, than the official evaluation um, uh, concluded. They thought about 750 claimants were being taken off the books in the, in, the, um, in the median NRF district. Presumably the lower number is because they didn't control for differential trends, although the model they use is somewhat different. It's a, it's a, it's a relatively kind of cross-sectional model, doesn't, doesn't control for much. Um, certainly it seems like their results are, are biased downwards. We also find that self-employment was uh, the, the increase in self-employment caused by the NRF was quite uh, was quite high, and that is something that was observed to be an unexpected benefit of the neighbourhood renewal fund at the time. Um, policy uh, people that the, the people that ran the policies in the um, in the in the local in the local um, partnerships, in the local strategic partnerships, were pleasantly surprised by the enthusiasm for self-employment in those areas. By all accounts, and that's something that, 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 that we that comes out of our results. Um, some extra results that I didn't put in uh, because you know it's only a twenty-minute presentation is that we split the effect of um, of the NRF on job seekers claimants by age group, and the effect seems to be particularly pronounced for younger claimants. Possibly because they stay in education longer, but we're not entirely sure um, at this point in time. We use a spatial diff and diff model to uh, tease apart direct and indirect effects. And there seems to be indirect effects on claimants, um, i.e. claimant numbers seem to be decreasing in areas that neighbour NRF treatment areas that but are not themselves treated. We think that's probably because in... In, in, in the larger cities in which the NRF was implemented, and particularly in London, um, people don't necessarily need to go to the um, job centres that are in their, in, their, in their district of residence, right? It's perfectly possible to live in Hackney and, and for the closest job centre to be in, 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 in Tower Hamlets, for example, or vice versa. So we think it's probably just a simple, um, a simple data definition problem driving that indirect effect, but we're not entirely sure. There is minor evidence of a potential positive spillover for jobs, which would be consistent with people finding employment outside of their area. Um, and finally, our, robust or our, our, our results are robust to the inclusion of um, dummies for different policies implemented by the new Labour government, which affected similar areas, particularly the New Deal for communities, which is thought to have had some effect on and there does seem to be some evidence of a, of a compound effect of the, of the NDC and the NRF on, on employment in our results, but largely our results are, are pretty robust to that. Um, so final thoughts, and I'll wrap up. The, 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 the goal of the NRF uh, and, the neighbor, and, and the National Strategy for Neighbourhood Renewal broadly was to improve relative outcomes in a variety of um, um, measures um, in deprived parts of health um, outcomes, education, 
we already know from Alonso Tau that uh, there was a, a significant um, the education, the official education uh, evaluation in 2010 was pretty thorough. Um, and from our results, we think that the Neighbourhood Rule Fund also had a pretty significant impact on local labour supply in the sense that local claimants count decreased, which is consistent with people getting jobs in those areas. Um, but we think that those jobs are being found in, in outside of outside of the of the of the NRF treatment areas. Basically, what we're talking about here is something that um, that Helen Ladd used to call a place based people strategy. So they're place based in the sense that they target specific parts of the country, but they're not place based in the sense that they mainly focused on, say, infrastructure, which is what a towns fund is focusing on. What they did was they um, focused more on, 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 on programmes and policies that helped people into education, that helped people into employment, that asked people, you know, what do we need in these areas for, um, for young people to stay in school rather than um, in committing petty crime, so on and so forth. Um, so that's what the NRF did, and it seems to have done it quite successfully. Um, the other characteristic which has been noted to have been um, important at the time was the fact that there was no there was no tendering, there was no applications, there was no lottery system. You didn't have to apply for funds to the NRF. The NRF ex ante identified 88 deprived areas and those areas were given money and people in those areas were included in the conversation about how to spend it rather than the single regeneration budget which preceded it, in which, in, in which local authorities had to apply to central funds, and um, the, the towns fund and the levelling up funds that we're seeing now, which has returned to that kind of model. So there are clearly lessons here. There are clearly lessons here if, um, if, if, if the current government is serious about levelling up. Um, whether or not they want to learn anything from, from, from new Labour's experiences is, is, is not clear, but certainly I think that, um, that, that the policymakers would do well to go back and, and, and look at how the Neighbourhood Renewal Fund worked and, and, and the achievements that it, that it had. Um, and that's me done. Um, a, one last point, a purpose of absolutely nothing. If anyone knows uh, anything of the whereabouts of the old Employment Record 2 data, then possibly know about anyone that worked for the Department of Employment in the, in the 80s or anything. For, for, for a second. Um, and that is me, 100 Okay, thanks very much, Rob. Uh, um, so now I'd like to introduce Tanya uh, from the University of Glasgow, who is going to talk about the um, an analysis of people holding multiple jobs and whether this is a route out of poverty. Um, so thank you very much for uh, the invitation to, to talk today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, a new piece of work uh, that I'm, I'm doing, looking at individuals who are in multiple employment, focusing specifically on individuals who are in uh, multiple low paid employment. And uh, this first piece of work is going to be very descriptive, where I'm going to be looking at the trends in this type of employment over time, as well as the, uh, as the characteristics of workers. And the reason that I'm presenting it here is because uh, this, this work uh, drew from um, almost three decades of data uh, availability in the labour force survey. So the, the broad research question that, that has initiated this piece of work is the idea of whether taking on more employment provides a route out of, uh, out of poverty. And uh, there was a piece of evidence that uh, uh, one of uh, the, 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 my project co-members saw uh, from the FRS that suggested that there was a gender imbalance in, in holding multiple jobs. So we went and looked in the, in the, the data, we couldn't really find too much uh, looked in the evidence, sorry, in the literature, and couldn't find very much in the, the evidence about multiple job holding. Um, but you know, what little we found, uh, like you know, as I said from this uh, from the FRS, was that it appeared to be 
that for women, the poverty rate did not fall uh, when they were holding multiple employments, whereas uh, there was some evidence that, act, that for men, um, the converse held that either uh, that, that there was, that it was able to pull them out or above the poverty threshold. And multiple low paid employment is something that we, would, that we think may be of particular interest because this type of, of, of employment, so, so um, juggling two jobs as well as other responsibilities may, may, may be very difficult for individuals. So as I said, this, uh, we started out with basically some scoping work to go uh, to understand, like, you know, is this, how, how large of a phenomenon is this? Has this changed over time? And also trying to go and look at the characteristics of the workers themselves, as well as the characteristics of the type of jobs uh, that people work when they're working at multiple employment. And as I said before, it'd be, uh, especially in this, uh, in, in this uh, talk, we're gonna be focusing on low paid, multiple low paid employment. So what I'm going to be looking at is the extent of uh, multiple low paid employment and how it has changed over time. Going to be looking at the characteristics of workers as well as uh, the features of the work that is done. Well, the first uh, like conceptual issue that we came across is well, how would we define multiple low paid employment? So, uh, defining multiple employment, you have more than one one employment is is fairly straightforward, but uh, how do we define multiple low paid employment? So, a standard definition. Um, is the OECD definition that it, it's employment paid below two thirds of the median wage. Um, one thing that we were thinking about is whether this should be defined, defined uh, through hourly wages of each employment or uh, as weekly wages overall. And within the LFS, and I think this is quite well known, uh, that there is, um, because LFS is self-reported data, there is uh, a potential for measurement error in that uh, individual's responses uh, may, um, may go and give estimates of their hours, hours of work. So we do think that like, you know, individuals who are paid an hourly rate may have a good estimate of the number of hours that they have worked in the previous week. But if uh, individuals who are paid a, a fixed wage um, may not actually keep track of their hours as accurately as, as, as those who, who, uh, who are uh, working on an hourly contract. There's also an issue in the LFS that uh, there is like, there is a you know, quite a higher degree of individuals who will report um, weekly wages or monthly wages, um, but don't actually re report uh, hours. Um, so there's a, a missing, missing, uh, there's more missing observations uh, for hours reported. And then we were also thinking, uh, like, you know, one of the issues that uh, whether you fall within a definition of being multiple low paid um, is also a uh, to some degree a choice variable in terms of an individual may be working in a job uh, where their hourly wage rate would not put them into multiple low paid employment, but they may only be working um, a smaller number of hours. So they would fall into the definition of uh, low paid in, uh, employment according to weekly wages. And of course, it may happen the other way that an individual may be working um, a job that does on an hourly rate that does fall below, but actually works uh, more hours in order to go and bring them, them um, above. So we have uh, some uh, comparisons that we're doing using both measures at, at an hourly uh, of hourly wages and, and, and weekly wages. Um, there are some differences in terms of when we're looking at the prevalence of, of, um, of multiple low paid uh, employment. But when we look at the characteristics of workers, it does really, uh, there isn't as much of a difference when we're looking at uh, the distribution of characteristics of workers and also jobs. We also came across, and I think again, this is, is, is well known for, for people who work 
uh, with the, the various surveys that capture wages is that there is a discrepancy between wage calculations that use different sources. Um, so specifically, I looked at uh, the, the calculation according to the Labour Force Survey, the Family Resources Survey, and the ASH data, the Annual Survey of Hours and Earnings. The, uh, the latter is the one that is generally relied on for those headline figures of median um, and, and mean wages because it's um, uh, because this is comes from uh, administrative records and uh, so it's not self-reported data and it seemed to seem to be more objective and also I think the larger size of the coverage is larger. Um, however, when I looked in and when I looked into it, did see that indeed if I look at the labor force survey, um, especially in comparison to those other sources, there is quite a substantial difference. So like, you know, this is uh, close to one pound, one pound 50 per hour, which uh, is quite large and also about 50 pounds or so per week. So we, we decided to uh, take the, um, uh, we, we're using actually the um, ASH derived uh, uh, level of median wages in order to go and do our, our calculation here. So moving on to, first of all, uh, looking at the trends in multiple low-paid low employment. So as I was saying before, because we're using the Labour Force Survey and we're using the, the quarterly Labour Force Survey as, as introduced in 1992, we can look at almost three decades of, of data. And this is something that they can, uh, being able to look as far back really goes and gives us uh, a picture of the prevalence. And you can see that Overall prevalence, so this is the proportion of workers who are working in multiple low paid employment has been coming down steadily over time. Um, so it was around 2% uh, like, you know, 30 years ago, uh, down to about 1% now. But this, looking at this overall picture really does uh, mask the differences by gender. So as we can see, that uh, you know, about half a percent of male workers fall within this category, whereas for female, female workers, uh, and, and that level has been fairly constant over time. Whereas for female workers, uh, they this is what is driving that decline in multiple low paid employment. However, something that I was thinking about literally uh, just for the last a few days, I do want to go and examine this a little bit further because if I contrast this trend with the overall employment rate, uh, which has been upwardly trended over time over the past 30 years, right? Um, and we've seen that this upward trend is slightly higher for women as compared to men. So in men over this period, this is a difference from of about five percentage points between the early 90s and uh, the last data point is 2019 here, where uh, so an increase of around five percentage points over 30 years. For women, this is um, around a 10% um, a um, increase in employment. And of course, what that is, is the denominator uh, of the multiple low paid um, employment trends that I just showed you. So uh, there may well be a compositional effect here, such that, um, because employment is rising uh, for both men and women, uh, because employment is rising, it may be the case that the, uh, uh, that the number of individuals who are falling within multiple low paid employment is increasing, uh, but it's increasing at, at a lower rate than the, uh, the number of individuals who are uh, in, in employment. So that is something I'm going to caveat that I haven't checked yet, but... Um, going to go back into the data to, to look at that as a composite, uh, whether there's this compositional effect. Um, and we can also contrast this with the trend in low paid employment. So this has been decreasing over the period. We can see that a, a large decrease happened towards the end of the 1990s. And this has often been attributed to the introduction of uh, the national minimum wage. Um, uh, so, and then, then uh, ha but has been, steadily declining over this entire period. And again, this is something that you know, is really 
driven by or driven more by uh, that decline in the proportion of women who are in low paid employment. But something here uh, to note is that um, this decline is, uh, is faster than in the previous graph for multiple low paid employment, that we do have a decline that, that, that appears to have leveled out somewhat from the, the late 2000s um, in, in, for multiple low paid employment, although it's carried on decreasing for low paid employment uh, overall. So just to summarize uh, uh, those findings, uh, there is strong evidence that the proportion of workers uh, in multiple uh, low-paid employment has been declining over the past uh, three decades, uh, driven predominantly by the decrease in the female rate. But, uh, then, but uh, I do want to do some more work to uh, look at whether uh, there's some sort of composition effect here um, because of that strong rise in the female employment rate. We see that the rate of decrease for multiple low paid employment as compared to low pro, uh, paid employment uh, slowed uh, from the mid 2000s, which indicates like, you know, that that was uh, you know, coincidental just timing wise with uh, great, uh, the Great Recession and the, the introduction of austerity soon afterwards. So now moving on to the, the characteristics. First of all, we're going to look at the characteristics of workers, and uh, there's a lot of data points here, so I'll, I'll just going to highlight the ones that I uh, think are uh, quite interesting. Oh, this, this first panel here is all workers, so uh, workers in all types of employment, and in the second panel on the right-hand side, I'm focusing on individuals within multiple low-paid employment. And one of the things that can go and pick that, that is striking for me is is uh, the first indication that uh, male uh, workers in multiple low paid employment uh, are somewhat different to female workers in multiple low paid employment. So if we look at uh, cohabitation status or, or, relation or partnership status, um, the indication here is that there is a lower rate of cohabitation and marriage um, amongst uh, male individuals in MMLPE compared to um, all workers, whereas the proportions for female are more or less the same. When we look at formally married, we see that a, a, a higher proportion of females who were previously married, and this could be separated, divorced or widowed, are in multiple low paid employment. Looking at the impact of children, um, we see that women in multiple low paid employment are more likely to have dependent children, but older dependent children. So this is not about, this is not young children. Um, indeed, they're, they're less likely to have young dependent children, but more likely to have older dependent children and overall more dependent children than their counterparts, um, than when we look at all female workers. And something uh, that does pop out that for both male and, and female, uh, they are more likely to be in the seat of, of benefits. And this is benefits excluding um, child benefit payments. Uh, following on, if we look at age groups, here we do have, like, again, another indication that uh, male and female uh, workers in multiple low paid employment are, are different. For male workers, we, it really is the younger age groups. And you can see this declining, uh, declining proportion of individuals in multiple low paid employment. For male workers, declining with age, um, well, a decline in age up to uh, the period just before uh, the run up to retirement. However, for women, this is an increase in pattern. So for women, it is uh, older women who are in their, their 30s and their 40s who are more likely to be working um, in multiple, multiple uh, employment and multiple low paid employment. We see little ethnicity dif differences, um, especially for men. There are slight ethnicity differences uh, for women, um, but we, these are very small numbers. Um, and this may also be related to um, different rates of labor force participation uh, uh, amongst ethnic groups uh, for, for, for women. Um, and uh, uh, very little difference in terms of UK nationality. 
Uh, something that uh, I found uh, a little unexpected was that the, the, the relatively high education rates. So I, I would admit that I had a prior that uh, individuals in low paid employment, especially mo multiple low paid employment, would have a far lower rate of uh, holding a degree. And, and actually it is fa fairly sizable of uh, proportions of individuals who uh, work as in. Who are who hold a degree? Uh, one uh, and a couple of uh, large differences that we see is individuals in uh, multiple low pay, uh, paid employment are more likely to report having a long term illness and also uh, reporting some some type of disability. So just to summarise uh, the characteristics that I've been looking at for multiple low paid uh, workers is that male and female work, um, MLP workers are different. So male MLP workers appear uh, in the data appear to be younger, more likely to not be partnered or, or, or never, never been married. They have fewer children and there are no real um, uh, ethnicity differences. Whereas female more, more, uh, MLP workers are more likely to be older. Um, they're more likely to uh, be formally married, uh, so separated, widowed, or divorced, and have more older dependent children. And uh, children, and as I said, uh, like you know, they, they, there is an indication that they're less likely to be from ethnic minorities. But you know, key key similarities between the two groups is, as I was saying before, um, a higher uh, rate of benefit receipt and more likely to uh, report having. Uh, some sort of long-term illness or disability. Now moving on to the employment characteristics. First of all, uh, I looked at uh, work patterns and contract types, and what popped out from the data was that uh, the, the, the prevalence working uh, of working during the day uh, was very similar across the groups. Well, the one that really stood out is that individuals in multiple low paid employment are far more likely to be working during the evening. And this is related to uh, the type of employment that they will be taking. Um, and then I, did the, I looked at the industry sectors and, and multiple low paid employment is something that's specifically um, prevalent within arts, arts and hospitality, um, as well as in the service and the caring uh, sectors. But uh, uh, like you know, so consistent with arts and hospitality, there's, there's a higher prevalence of this type of working during the evening uh, compared to the other type of shift patterns. We do see a, a, a large, uh, a larger proportion of individuals in this type of employment who are working on zero hours contract compared to all out uh, to all uh, employment. But even though it is far higher, it doesn't explain it. This is not uh, all of the work in multiple low paid employment is within a zero hours contract. I mean, it's, it's still um, relative to, uh, relative to uh, the permanent rates. And the majority of individuals report that they have a permanent contract, at least in their first job. Um, uh, uh, like, you know, so, so it's not the case that all multiple low paid employment is on zero hours contract employment. One thing did go and find interesting is that when we look at when individuals are asked whether they work full time, a fairly low proportion in multiple uh, in LLP report work, working full hours, uh, full time hours. However, when I and uh, when I look at the number of the hours that they work, and I've, you know, whether they work the equivalent of full-time hours, and here I've, I've used the definition of working 35 hours or more is the equivalent of working full-time hours. We see that although they report less that they work full-time, when you look at the, the number of hours that they actually do, they're more likely to be working full-time uh, full hours. Of course, this is across uh, more than one job. So it may be that they're reporting full time in their first job only. Uh, they do work on average fewer hours than uh, in, uh, than than overall uh, for for workers in all employment, and they report uh, that they're more likely to report underemployment 
so that they would prefer to be working more hours and they are less likely to be uh, to reporting um, overemployment. Uh, also uh, looking at uh, further characteristics of the jobs, we see that the union coverage in for individuals who are working in, in multiple low paid employment is, is lower than compared to uh, overall. Um, the rate of working in the public sector is actually very is actually fairly similar, especially for, for women, slightly lower for men. Um, for the, the first job, we see that there's a, a lower rate of individuals who report working from home. And again, as I remind you, the last data point I have here is 2019. So this, this is not uh, uh, related to uh, the, the changes that happened during uh, the COVID pandemic. And they're far more likely to be working in occupations uh, that are uh, at the lower uh, at the lower tier of the uh, SOC uh, classification, so uh, more likely to be in manual and or elementary occupations. Looking at the second job in comparison to the first job, though, we see a far higher prevalence of working from home and, and a similar prevalence of uh, being in the manual and elementary occupations. So this really sums up what I was just uh, just saying saying there. Um, so as I was saying before, this is the first work stream in in a larger project where we're looking at women in multiple low paid employment. Uh, the project uh, contains a number of different work streams. So I'm working on the quantitative analysis, obviously. And the first step on that was to be looking at the nature and the extent of uh, multiple low paid employment in the UK and how and whether it has changed over time. But the features that, like, you know, that have come out of that has, has, uh, have led to subsequent questions that I'll be looking at in the future. I apologise, my dog is just coming from the dog walk. I'm just going to put him outside. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and one of the things that I want to go and look at in, the, in, in, in future work is uh, whether um, labour markets, labour market conditions influence the prevalence of multiple low, uh, low paid employment. Specifically, what we noticed there was with the, with the, the levelling out of uh, low paid employment after the Great Recession, is that somehow related to aggregate labour market effects or, or indeed lo local labour market effects? Also, uh, over this period, of course, there have been changes to social security measures, so for instance, the introduction of university credit and, and, and uh, austerity measures, whether that induced uh, any differences to the prevalence of working in multiple jobs. We'd also looked, um, want to be looking at the dynamic um, nature of multiple low paid employment. So is this a short term phenomenon for an individual or do individuals move in and out of multiple low paid employment? Um, and also relationships with uh, health, as I said, the, the indication there was uh, from, from the labour force survey data is that um, individuals do report a higher rate of long-term illness and disability, but is this related in somehow to multiple low-paid employment? And if so, in what direction does this go? Um, and also uh, looking at whether uh, caring responsibilities. So do individuals choose this type of working pattern because they have other responsibilities such as uh, childcare or, or elder care um, that, that they have to balance along with their employment. Uh, but another, uh, another, uh, another role of the quantitative analysis is to inform um, another work stream, which is look, which is going to undertake qualitative analysis. So this is the first time that I've I've worked in a multidisciplinary uh, project where we have both quantitative and qualitative an, uh, analysis. And what I have learned is that uh, that analysis is really going to be uh, is really informed by what we have found so far in in the in the quant side. So quantitative analysis is is good for showing us prevalence and the extent and associations, um, but it doesn't help us to under, really drill down and understand why. So um, the role of the qualitative an uh, analysis is to uh, undertake um, uh, engagement with individuals who are in 
multiple low paid employment and especially women who are in multiple uh, multiple low paid um, employment to, 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 to investigate their lived experiences of, of this type of employment. And uh, you know, the hypoth hypothesis so far is to really look at wanting to understand those mechanisms between uh, multiple low paid uh, working and health and also uh, how and, and whether care responsibilities are at play. So thank you very much uh, for your for your attention there, and I'm I'm happy to go and take any questions or or, or discussion now, um, or do feel free to 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 drop me an email at any time. Uh, always happy to go and talk about this type of work.